when you thank God, you're to show you, you show how grateful you are. Thanks for him loving you. Thanks for his kindness, his mercy, his acknowledging his benefits, his favor in your life. And you thank you for faithfulness. And a lot of people are thankful to God and thankful for God, right? Mm -hmm. So praise means you confess, sing, and honor for what he's done or what he's about to do, which leads you more into faith, right? It means to brag or to rave about God. So people are thankful and we work and people praise, but people don't worship. Worship means to reverence God. It means to bow, to make yourself low, to give homage, to focus on God's work. And that word reverence means to honor, to respect, respect or, or show, respect that is felt or shown. And then it came to a word that's called deference. And that word deference, honey, when I looked at it, means to defer to God. It means to yield to his preferences, his wishes, to submit to his opinion, actions, and attitudes. So many people are not true worshipers. That's why God said they're not, they don't worship me in spirit because to worship actually means to defer, which means my opinions, my thoughts, my actions don't matter to me as much as God's. So I, when I defer to him, I become a true worshiper. To reverence, um, to pay homage, it means to show respect to the king or royalty or special honor. But when I got to that word deference, I realized that a true worshiper gives up their right, which is the reason why when Abraham took Isaac up, up there, he says, the lad and I are going to worship. He loved his son. He did not want to kill his son, but God asked him to kill his son. So he deferred to God's wishes over his own. He deferred to God's um, actions over his own, and he trusted God through the process. The problem is that we don't really worship God because worship involves trust. dying to self and trusting trust. God more than I trust my feelings, more than I trust my thought patterns, more than I trust my traditions, more than I trust what I've grown up with or what I've known. It means to defer to God in every action and will in my life. So we haven't become true worshipers. So that was it. <laughs> and so what I was going to share this morning too is that I'm, I'm taking... Um, a young adult through John 14 and I'm having them do a soap that's scripture observation application and principle and I got to verse 30 here John 14 30 and it says just as talking says I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me and so I had to kind of figure out you know how I do I kind of figure out what he's really saying here. So I go to the um, commentary. It's powerful. It says, um, it says there is, uh, uh, he says, there is in me no principle or feeling that accords with his and nothing. Therefore, by which he can prevail. So simply, so it says temptation has only power because we uh, I'm sorry, because there are some principles in us which accord with the designs of the tempter. So he said that, that Satan has no power over him because there's nothing inside of Jesus that can be tempted. And the reason that we're tempted is because there's some stuff inside of us that Satan knows that are not in alignment or parallel to the word of God. And so he knows that we can be tempted by those things. And so then um, it goes on to say that temptation has only, the, has only power because there are some principles in us which accord with the designs of the temper, tempter and which may be excited by presenting corresponding objects until our virtue is overcome. Where there is no such propensity Temptation has no power as the principles of Jesus were wholly on the side of virtue. The meaning here may be that though he had the natural appetites of man, his virtue was so supreme that Satan had nothing in him which could constitute any danger that he would be led into sin and that there was no fear of of the result of the conflict before him. So we can only be tempted by what Satan knows we're going to want in the first place. So um, just like James, I think it's James 3 says that um, 
Well, first of all, it says that that don't say God tempts you, but because you can't be tempted. And the, then it says that we're drawn away by our own desires and lusts. So Satan won't tempt you with 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 what he knows is not in your um, paradigm or your propensity. So to not be tempted is to mean that you are you are completely one with Christ and that you. What's the word that you used a second ago about worship? That you defer to Christ. That you defer. And so when he comes at you and says, hey, do this, you go, no, I think I'm going to defer to Christ. When he comes at you and says, let's do, you know what? I'm going to defer to Christ. And growing as a Christian, you know you're, you're, you know you're growing when you exchange and say, I don't want Jesus just in my heart. I want him to be on the throne of my heart. I learned from Pastor Dan, so that's important. Hallelujah.